Our next speaker, we've got straight into our next speaker, is Warren Black, Principal of Complexus, um, and he's talking to us about building resilience into modern organisations. Would we welcome Warren Black to the stage? professional like all of you. I work within complex organisations and help them bring uh, better governance, risk and assurance capability to the table. My particular area of expertise or area of interest is around the complexity sciences um, and the reason being is that about three years ago um, I found myself having a sort of a, a career moment where I, I had to think about whether risk was something I wanted to proceed with. I was a little bit disillusioned with the way risk management was going and I couldn't see how this was going to actually help us when the world was clearly getting more and more complex. So um, about three years ago, I started working with the Queensland University of Technology on a premise that our world is not getting any simpler. It's getting more and more complex. And therefore, most of our management processes, most of our management disciplines actually need to advance into a world of more complexity. So we started looking for answers. What could help us improve risk management in a world that is getting more and more complex? And we found a lot of um, encouraging stuff with a lot of potential in the complexity science. It's complex systems theory in particular. And what I'm going to share with you today are some of the things that we are, are coming across in our, our research. Um, particularly about nine months ago, someone approached me and said, would you mind putting an academic thought piece together based on you know, scientifically valid research around how we can improve resilience in modern organizations, particularly in the modern era in a world of perpetual disruption? And what I'm going to share with you is a, a more presentation friendly version of what we came up with. So I, I do this at uh, all my presentations, a couple of you have been to these before, just by a show of hands, how many people here believe that either their personal role as a risk professional or the organization that they work with, them, their success is dependent on the ability to effectively manage complexity? Show of hands. Okay, so we've got about half there, all right? As a show of hands, how many people here believe or at least have uh, studied the science of complexity. In other words, you have a formal degree of some form in complexity theory, complexity sciences, complexity management, complex program leadership. Anybody with formal study in the science of complexity? Okay, not one. And this is a big group, all right? So what you've just experienced is what is known as the complexity gap. The degrees of complexity that one organization is like being experiencing or and being expected to control is somewhere up here. Our understanding of complexity and our experience with complexity is down here. And that presents a very real world challenge for us. Our world is not getting any simpler, it's getting more and more complex. Take a look at this now, all right? Most of you know intuitively that the world has changed, but this is how it has changed, all right? At the end of the 1700s, we had our first industrial revolution as the world went from manual processes to steam, the steam revolution. Imagine a world before steam and a world after steam. The world, working world in particular was disrupted. All of a sudden, management process has to change, organizations had to change, organizations had to evolve. And they went nicely. Then all of a sudden, global trade became quicker. We had uh, much uh, more efficient supply routes, much more efficient production. And then somewhere along the line, another industrial revolution came along in the early uh, 1900s, when the world was introduced to electricity. Imagine a working world before electricity and after electricity. Again, completely disrupted. The world changed. Working process had to change. Working understanding had to change, and management companies and management control all evolved again. Then somewhere around the late 80s, the early 90s, we had yet another revolution, the computer revolution. We saw the birth of personal computers, software, the internet, the intranet, and all of a sudden everything moved to, com to the computers. Typewriters went out the windows, everybody had a personal computer. And pretty soon there was a computer in every office of any home. Then the world changed again. In 2016, the World Economic Forum stood up and announced that we were now in the fourth industrial revolution, the technology revolution. And this is a very, very different revolution to anything we've ever experienced before. The thing that makes the fourth revolution so unique are two factors. The first one is for the first time in human history, we have absolute global connectivity. Every single person on this planet is connected to every other single person on this planet through trade, travel, tourism, and technology. Every person here has a personal computer in their pocket that is connected to every other personal computer in the pocket. We are a global, complex system, highly interconnected, highly codependent. We get our news from the same sources, we get it in real time. 
Donald Trump says something on the other side of the world, within five minutes it's on our phone, we're all looking at it, we're all reacting it. We understand the same things, we see the same things, we get the same news. We've never lived in an era like that before. The second thing about the fourth industrial revolution is this concept of perpetual disruption. Right? Continually emerging technologies, product trends, consumer behaviors, data sets, and stakeholder relation. Things are changing more frequently than ever before. Things that we accept today, that are mainstream today, that are innovative today, will almost certainly be obsolete tomorrow, and in quicker time periods than ever. We are now entering the age of perpetual disruption, and it has massive implications for organizations and risk management in particular. And this is something I want to share with you. This is how it works, all right? Most of you here are old enough or privileged enough to remember encyclopedias. About 20, 30 years ago, if we wanted to research something, somebody asked us a question and we didn't know the answer off by heart, we had two choices. We either caught the bus to the library to go have a look at a book, or if we were privileged, we had a set of encyclopedias in our home or in our offices. And we went to the encyclopedia and we had a look. So if somebody asked you a question like, what is the capital of Bolivia? Well, I don't know. I'd go to my encyclopedias and look it up. Law firms, professional services, accounting firms, all had encyclopedias. Academics, scholars, professional people, middle class and privileged income housing, all had encyclopedias, and that's how you did your research. The world's leader for almost 250 years was Encyclopedia Britannica. They were the top research book company in the world. They provide book sets from four to 30 book sets, and everybody had them if you were privileged. Challenges somewhere around the early 90s, Microsoft came to them and said, listen, can we take your 30 volumes of knowledge and put it onto a small CD-ROM? Now, the problem with the Britannicas was that they cost around about $2,000 for a full book set, and within a year they were obsolete, right? The world was changing, right? And now you were stuck with a book set that was outdated. So what they said, we put it on CD-ROM, we can make it interactive, we can update it every year, and it'll cost roughly $50, and we'll distribute it worldwide. And the Board of Britannica went back and thought about it, and they came back to Microsoft and they said, well, you know what, we're a book company, we print, that's our expertise, that's our brand. We're not really into this technology stuff, so we're not up for it. And in making that decision, history was made, because Microsoft then went to Encyclopedia and Carter, a lesser known player in North America, and made the same deal. Within four years, and Carter were the world's leading provider of CD-ROM encyclopedias and the world's largest knowledge hub. And you could not even have to pay $50 for the CD because you get it free with a, a Windows product of some sort. Right? And they ruled for about 10 years because five years after that deal, um, Encyclopedia Britannica actually went bankrupt. So they were the world's leaders for 250 years, and within five years, they were completely bankrupt. That is how quick this rush was happening. Now, Encarta, anybody have an Encarta CD? Probably not, why? Because pretty soon after Encarta actually left the market, Wikipedia and Google came up. So all of a sudden, website referencing became a thing. And there was no need for Encarta. So they ruled for 10 years, and then websites came along. Pretty shortly after that, peer-to-peer -peer social media type referencing came along. You and I still Google, but the next generation, our kids, they go onto Instagram and they connect up with their friends. Or they go onto the Facebook page or the website of the professional who they want to get reference from. You can link up to people and answer. So what happens now when they have referencing, they just go find a friend basically through the internet. Now where we are is Siri and Bixby are coming along and you can actually ask your, your phone for them, what's the capital of Bolivia? Your phone will actually tell you. That is perpetual disruption, all right? Britannica ruled for 250 years, but they were never gonna survive. Then CD-ROM, 13 years, web-based HR, social media for two years, voice commands the next way. This is perpetual disruption in action. More and more of this is going to happen. It's going to disrupt our businesses, our ways of thinking, and the things that we have come to accept. All right. So let's talk about some modern influences of disruption. Things that we haven't quite worked out how they're going to affect. All right. Probably one of the most obvious, the clo most closely watched president of the world. Love him or hate him, he is disruptive. The policies that he is breaking, the social norms that he is challenging, we've never seen anything like it. He is disrupting trade agreements that took decades to get up and, and, and going. He's doing things that presidents before have never done for one reason or another. Whether this is good or bad, I have no idea, and probably most of you don't. But the fact is it's going to end up influencing our businesses and the way we do business one way or another. Right? Brexit. Many insurance companies are now asking companies to do dependency analysis on any widgets, goods, or services or labor that are dependent on Britain. Because when the economic walls come up, we don't know how that's going to impact labor or supply or demand. Things that took three weeks to order might now take three to six months to order. How that's going to affect the production line, we don't know. So this is a disruptive influence that we don't know what it's going to do, and it has tremendous risks. Artificial intelligence and robotics. 
another big wave that's coming through. Some of the more aggressive um, analysts out there say that 50% of the jobs that we have now will be obsolete or redundant within 30 years. If it takes 20 to 30 years to make an expert, we don't even know what our future experts look like. What are we going to say? For those of your parents whose kids are about to go to college, are you comfortable sending your kids to college to learn a skill that's going to be redundant in 10 years? We don't know how artificial intelligence with robotics is going to uh, uh, impact labor, expertise, and that kind of thing. But there's some tremendous risks around this from what I'm more asking, as there are opportunities. Cryptocurrencies, that may be the future. What happens if we move to a cashless world? A lot of people say cryptocurrency is the future, and eventually we'll get to a point where cash no longer exists. Does your business know how that's going to impact it? And the one that I absolutely love and I talk about the most is this concept of the swipe left culture. You've all heard of those apps out there where you flip through it and you swipe left, don't like it, don't like it, don't like it, swipe left. It's been ingrained in the next generation psyche that if you don't like something, if it's too bureaucratic, if it's too inefficient, swipe left. Don't accept it, just move on to the next step. A very good example of that is Uber. Uber started off as a ride-sharing platform, but very quickly became the leading competitor to the taxi industry. Why? Because people were sick and tired of the taxi industry. They're inefficient. You hardly ever get somebody who knows where they're going. You get ripped off too often, and you try catching a cab in the rain on a busy day. Uber cut through all of that. Every time Uber entered the country, it was illegal in the beginning because it didn't pay taxes. But pretty soon it had to go legal because people were swiping left on the taxi industry and were just moving to Uber anyway. So it was illegal until it wasn't. But Uber is a very good example of the swipe left culture. And this presents tremendous risk and opportunity for us because if we're an organization that has any level of bureaucracy or inefficiency in our life, we are going to get swiped left. The next generation just won't accept it. They are not going to stand in a queue for services. They will swipe left on you and move on to the next thing. So, we now know that we're in a world of perpetual disruption. So what is the answer to that? Most of you have probably got a, a good feeling. It's resilience, all right? Resilience is a specific characteristic of a complex system. It is the ability of the system to respond positively to environmental changes. So in a world of perpetual disruption, organizations have to become more resilient to whatever what this way comes. We have to become more resilient to disruption and emergent risk. And this is the future of risk management. So just so that we all know what we're talking about, what is a complex system? Well, in this context, a complex system is a system comprising of an advanced number of interconnected contributing parts. And in many cases, it exists in a highly energized state as they are continually interacting and adapting to their environmental circumstances. So once you understand that, you'll see that there are natural systems out there like the weather, a rainforest, a food chain, whatever it may be. And there are man-made complex systems such as social networks, political systems, the economy, uh, large projects, modern organizations. So a lot of people are starting to look at natural complex systems in light of how can we learn from resilience factors in natural, concepts, uh, uh, natural complex systems and take them into man-made systems. For example, the Amazon rainforest. Amazon rainforest is 55 million years old. It covers roughly 7 million square kilometers. Right? Now, anything that big that has lasted for that long clearly has some lessons to learn, or lessons to offer at least, about how big, complex organizations can be resilient. And this is the idea. A lot of people are trying to look at complex systems and look at the learnings from those and bring them into modern organizations and modern risk management. So, just to give you a bit of context, our modern working world has become a complex adaptive system. Tell me how the Amazon rainforest is any different to the world we now live in. Our world of absolute global connectivity is a colossal system of 7 billion interconnected contributing parts. They are existing in a highly energized state, continually interacting with and adapting to new environmental circumstances. And that is why complex systems and complexity theory offer so much potential for what the future of risk and resilience might look like, and why so many people, not just myself, are looking to extract those learnings into modern day risk management frameworks. So to give you an example of how complexity science can help, how does the complexity science explain resilience? In other words, the need to be intelligent people and positive. Well, one of the challenges that we have is that most conventional views of resilience are more around bouncing back to a business as usual state. Uh, the engineering definition of resilience is the ability of an entity to return back to its original state after experiencing stress. The example I like to use is a car aerial. You pull a car aerial and you let it go, it's going to go, but it eventually comes back to rest at business as usual, right? And that is a resilient engineering structure. The problem, though, about bouncing back to business as usual is that it ignores the premise that maybe, maybe, just maybe, the reason you experience disruption was because your business as usual model was flawed or vulnerable or obsolete. So clearly, uh, bouncing back 
to a pre-existing state of vulnerability is not what you want to do. What you want to do is actually bounce forward to a new, better, more contextually relevant state. And this is where a lot of the modern day thinking and the complex systems of thinking around resilience is. It's about agility, adaption, the evolution, metamorphosis, the ability to be intelligently responsive to change. That is what resilience truest and oldest definition is. And this is what many organizations need to start taking on board in the age of perpetual disruption. So just to get a little bit theoretical, and I'm not going to freak you out with too much theory, but you need to understand what we're dealing with here. How do the complexity sciences explain disruption? Well, they see it as a functional relationship between the concept of emergence, vulnerability, and dependency. Now, emergence represents the situation of upswells and shifts and stresses which might arise from the environment. In other words, change, changing phenomena. That is emergence, all right? Vulnerability are those internal gaps, weaknesses, immaturities, and inefficiencies that exist within your system. And dependency is how interconnected and codependent the relationships with the system are. It's a bit of a mathematical formula at simplest level. Disruption equals emergence plus uh, vulnerability plus um, dependence. So to explain how it works, I like this scenario, the concept of an immune system. So imagine a germ floating around in the stratosphere. That is a potentially disruptive phenomenon, an emergent phenomenon. It floats around, it's completely harmless until it finds a vulnerability in my body. Let's say a cut above the knee. So this little germ finds a cut above the knee. Emergence plus vulnerability equals localized disruption and infection. You get an infection. Now, if my antibodies can deal with it fine, but if they can't, that infection turns to gangrene and it starts spreading through the host system. Now, here's the thing. Whether I experience system-wide shutdown or just localized disruption is dependent on my uh, dependence on my knee. I'm not that dependent on it. I like it, I like having it, it's very useful, but I can actually cut it off. And that's what they do in operations. They surgically remove you above the knee if you have gangrene in the area to save the host body. So what I'm actually doing is decoupling from my dependence on my knee. I have a redundant knee that I can use and I can always get a prosthetic. It's an extreme solution, I know, but it saves the host body. And this is the thing that we're trying to get into organizational resistance. Now imagine that same e emergent phenomenon of the germ goes into my body and finds a weakness in my lung. I get an infection in my lung, which turns into bronchitis, probably pneumonia. If my body, antibodies can't deal with it, my body is critically dependent on my lung. I cannot exist without my lung. So that critical dependency and my inability to decouple from my lung now kills me. System-wide total disruption. And that is what this is saying. Disruption can only occur when we have an emergent phenomena that meets a vulnerability and we are critically dependent and cannot decouple from that dependency. And basically what that's telling us is that this is a codependent triangle. And the key learning here is that if you're an organizational that wants to bring resilience to you, just manage the triangle. Find better ways to uh, identify emergent phenomena. Find better ways to reduce your vulnerability. That's pretty much what your audit program is supposed to do. But does it cover everything? I don't know. So if you can reduce internal vulnerabilities and uh, see emergence when it arise, and get rid of either one of those two, then you never have to worry about dependence. But if you can't, get rid of your dependence on it. So remove any one of those sides, and you are preventing disruption, and therefore are resilient. So in its simplest form, if you want to become intelligently responsive to the emergence of disruptive forces, uh, in other words, resilient, improve your system-wide awareness of emerging phenomena, eliminate systemic vulnerability, and de-intensify system-wide dependency. So the research I did earlier in the year actually built on this. How would we do this in an organization? What would the things that organizations need to do in each of those three areas be in order to become more resilient? And this is what we played around with. So the first thing we did was look at improved system-wide awareness of emerging phenomena. And two examples of that, improve emergence detection, our ability to see emergent phenomena coming, and address any emergence hotspots within your organization. And we came up with a whole lot of things. And I apologize, I don't expect you to read all the details. I just want to show you what we're doing. Every one of those line items is essentially a case study that we found in the literature and in the research, which demonstrates how a natural system builds up resilient antibody and becomes resilient. And the key thing is you don't have to do it all. You just have to pick one or two because it's, a, it's a, an order trail basically. If you can eliminate, or if you can get any one of those two right in your organization, you'll uh, stop emerging phenomena disrupting you. So we came up with all of these things. And normally I workshop it with organizations and we would try and turn this into personal models within the organization. But at the top there, one of the most obvious ones, improve the organization's environmental scanning mechanism. 
So diagnostic surveys, impact assessments, trend analysis, wargaming scenario, blah, blah, blah. All these things are designed to improve our ability to identify emergent phenomena. And this is something organizations are very bad at. Conventional risk management tends to promote an inwardly focused view of risk management, and our risk registers almost always end up looking at internal things, internal risk. And we're not looking at the strategic changes in the market or the environmental factors that are creating disruption and emergent phenomena which could disrupt them. We need to get better at looking outside as well as inside. So to give you an example of a case study of how this could work, I've highlighted two of those metrics in red, and it looks something like this. Combating emergence through neural networks. And we heard a great example earlier about how the CABs and the uh, police organizations are interlinked so they can provide intelligence to each other when there's a system. So the police are using all the CABs out there because they're roaming all around the city, looking at things, seeing things. Uh, we're looking for a stolen vehicle and every CAB has got a set of eyes on the road and they might just see it. That is a neural network. When you start combining contributing bodies in a system-wide network to gather intelligence, and probably one of the best case studies I've come across for this is um, Stanley McChrystal's team of teams. Uh, he, he was head of the Joint Task Force in Iraq, around about 1994, I think it was. And he was tasked with dealing with Al-Qaeda and getting a fix on how we beat Al-Qaeda. And he said when the US forces arrived there originally, they went with conventional battle thinking. They thought that the enemy was a traditional enemy. We on this hill in the color blue, they're on that hill in the color red, and all we've got to do is advance, 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 and take over that hill, and all of a sudden everything's blue. Is what he didn't realize, what they didn't realize was that Al Qaeda didn't have an army or, or tanks or everything. They were a social network, they were a guerrilla network. They existed everywhere and nowhere at the same time. They popped out of crowds, blew something up, and disappeared into the crowds again. You can't fight a battle like that with conventional thinking. So what he did was he built a neural network, he did a lot of research into complex systems theory, and he built a neural network where they took all the intelligence gathering agencies available to them, the British, the Russians, uh, the American, everybody, CIA, FBI, took the whole lot and put them into a collective network where they shared the same information, got access to the same stuff at the same time. Equally, they got all the tactical forces, the special forces, the rangers, everything in the same network. And for the first time in history, coming out of a Cold War, they were actually sharing information in real time. And that allowed them to cross-reference notes all the time and pick up incidents as they were about to emerge. And they could get a response team on the ground within five minutes. They could get a Navy SEAL or a, a Ranger team into the middle of Baghdad with five, within five minutes after somebody spotted an emergent phenomenon. That real-time information sharing, that neural network, that, that is something we've never seen before in risk management on this level. And this is a fantastic example of where modern organizations need to start going to gather the type of intelligence in their industry to identify emerging phenomena which could disrupt them. So if we look at the second part of the uh, triangle, eliminate system-wide vulnerability. Right? Our audit programs and our risk programs are supposed to do this. Strengthen known system weaknesses, improve our internal capability, and again, we came up with a whole lot of case studies that uh, natural systems seem to do that actually can help uh, benefit in this particular area. And the one that I want to focus on is the one in red. Improve the organization's ability to self-clean, self-heal, and self-correct. In other words, boost the system's internal immune system. Right? I came across a fantastic case study about the value of high-performing teams of becoming the cleaners or the immune system of organizations. We have always been told that the benefit of high-performing teams is to boost productivity, boost morale and culture. And yes, it is, but it also has another benefit. High-performing teams are natural problem solvers. If you can get your teams to the high-performing state, they have a tendency of walking around the, the organization like a, a pool cleaner or a vacuum, one of those robotic vacuum cleaners, and every time they see an inefficiency or something that doesn't work, something that's overly bureaucratic, they say, no, no, we're going to deal with it. They are natural problem solvers and they move around the organization just naturally like Pac-Man, chomping up inefficiencies and things that don't work because that's what high performing teams do. And in so doing, they do two things. They boost their organization's internal immune system. In other words, they improve the natural antibodies to disruption and vulnerability. And they also serve as natural cleaning agents within the system. So think of the Remora fish or the tick bird or the dung beetle. All of these are natural um, cleaning systems which go around and improve the strength of the whole system by cleaning up vulnerabilities and inefficiencies. And that's exactly what high performing teams do. So there's actually case studies about how high performing teams are one of the greatest contributors to organizational resilience. Now show me a single organization that in their business continuity and resilience plan talks about leveraging high performing teams. And this is the kind of thinking 
that's coming out of complex systems theory. There are things we can do to bring up natural antibodies and natural resilience within the organization. Then the last one is the concept of de-intensifying from systemic dependency. This is one of the hardest things to do because many organizations are dependent on certain things for natural reasons. So you're dependent on certain suppliers, you're dependent on certain clients, you're dependent on certain products. And it's not as easy to just replace them. Uh, sometimes you are very dependent. But the good news is that if you are one of those organizations, you can focus on the other two, emergence and vulnerability. But if you do want to focus on dependence, then there are a couple of things that you can do. The one I spoke about earlier, decoupling from your direct dependency, so the concept of uh, severing a knee when it's gangrenous, uh, secure alternatives to direct dependency, and then again, there's a whole lot of case studies behind this. And the, the one that I want to focus on is one that I came across when I, I was working uh, in mining risk. Essentially, um, this was about almost 20 years ago now. There were a couple of changes in the rubber industry, particularly at a time in the middle of South America, when Manas started ramping down the natural production of, of, of rubber trees and related products. And it sent ripple effects or butterfly effects through the rubber industry. And essentially what ended up happening was um, it started impacting certain types of tires. Now most tires were already moving towards synthetic, so it wasn't a, a challenge. But there was one particular type of tire that hadn't progressed that far for whatever reason. And it was the tires on the ore holders. So you see those big tire, rubbery tires on mining truck. And all of a sudden, the mining industry was under threat because you cannot move ore out of a mine without ore holders or without a thing. Sure, you can do it on conveyor belts or on mule, but the volume is just not going to be there. So the big boys, the BHPs, the Rios and that of the world, they just took out their checkbook and they went to the producers and said, look, we'll buy two years worth of tires and every tire that comes up the production line, we want first option and then we'll pay a premium. But what about the junior miners and the small miners who don't have that kind of wealth? They had to find other ways. And we got involved with a mining company in central Ghana, which is in Africa. Uh, we see the Google map over there. They were in the middle of the jungle and they suddenly realized that within 18 months they were possibly even shut down. They were bankrupt because if they didn't have all all the tires, they couldn't move all. So they started looking at ways to decouple from this dependency. It became clear that the entire mine was dependent on tires. What they did was very uh, um, ingenious, basically. We, we mapped out a number of scenarios, and one of the people came up with an idea. Why don't we hook up with the other mining companies in, in our uh, environment? There are a couple of other junior miners, three to be exact. And what they did was they actually bought, built a tire retreading plant out of Europe, dismantled it, put it in a container, shipped it into the middle of the jungle, and rebuilt the tire retreading plant. Now, all of a sudden, we are no longer dependent on the tire market because we can retread tires in perpetuity. And that is how they decouple from the systemic dependency on tires, which could disrupt their business. And these are the kind of things we've got to start thinking about. If we are critically dependent on something, how do we decouple in times of crisis? So what we ended up with was this big map of things that you could do. And again, I apologize for the small writing, but it's supposed to be workshop in a big A0 format. But essentially what we're doing with organizations is trying to turn that into measurable metrics within organizations, things that they can implement themselves and monitor to a desired level of maturity to improve the internal resilience. Because resilience is a systemic characteristic. It's not a management add-on, all right? So you've got to, if you want resilience, you've got to build it internally, systemically. Uh, Build that personality, that characteristic within the organization. Now, by now, you're probably saying, this is really good stuff, but it's very theoretical. Show me where it's been done. And I've got an example for you. Anybody here from Melbourne? I think there are a couple of people. Yeah? So, quite a few people from Melbourne. All right. In your home city right now, Melbourne is one of the 100 cities resilience initiative. It was started by the Rockefeller Center in, uh, Europe, uh, sorry, in, in uh, North America. The Rockefeller family had a big trust of money. Put it out there for uh, you know charity purposes one of the things that came up was the resilience initiative they identified that the world was actually growing bigger and bad all the time the population is going from seven billion people to nine billion probably within the next 20 years our biggest cities will be roughly 10 million people okay that's half the population of australia in one city cities like tokyo for example right so what happens when cities get that big urban decay and urban social problems become a problem too so your welfare your uh, homelessness, your vagrancy, um, low education, inner city uh, challenges and problems. So what they did was they uh, tried to find a way to improve urban resilience. And they came up with this Resilient Cities Initiative and they went into complex systems theory and they came up with a whole lot of principles that you could implement into a city based on complex systems theory that would make the city resilient, uh, urban resilient one. And they brought 100 cities on board of which Melbourne is one of them. Now here's the ingenious part of it. Okay? That, dashboard that you see, that big yellow thing, 
is basically, I'm not going to go back uh, there, it's basically a round version of that. They've taken that kind of thinking, they've found the metrics that are relevant to urban resilience, and they've turned it into it. And the idea is that is actually a performance management dashboard. All, all of those things that you see in there are personal urban resilience metrics that a city has to subscribe, and they've got to get to a desired level of maturity in all of those areas. And once they get there, the city itself will build up resilience to urbanization, the, the, the challenges and disruption that goes with urbanization. But more than that, the true genius of this is, is that once all 100 cities have done it, you now have a global network of resilience, interconnected cities, all acting at a highly resilient and mature level to provide global resilience to global social issues. Right? And this is exactly what organizations need to start doing, both on a personal level and with their industry players, is start building up a resilience to whatever this way may come. Folks, the days of risk registers are starting to be left behind. The more complex an environment becomes, the more irrationality, unpredictability, and emergence we should expect to see. So trying to foresee and predict every risk, every time, is not going to happen in the fourth industrial revolution, the age of perpetual disruption. And that is why resilience is the future, because it's the ability to respond intelligently is by building it in as a systemic characteristic of the organization, not a management add on. Right? So a couple of lessons learned today. In the modern working world, disruption is perpetual. I think we all get that. Secondly, the primary goal of organizational resilience should be to help the organization become intelligently responsible to, uh, responsive to the emergence of disruptive phenomena. Thirdly, organization-wide resilience can be achieved by controlling the three codependent contributing components of the disruption equation. So find a way to embed that in your organization. If you can get rid of any one of those sides, you should last 55 million years, just like the Amazon rainforest, right? Number four, resilience is a systemic characteristic of a complex system. Thus, organization-wide resilience can only truly be achieved by embedding a personal strain of resilience into the organizational DNA. It has to be part of the character of the organization. It can't be achieved by just adding on a few management actions like a business continuity plan or you know, a disaster recovery. Those are important, by the way, but that is not what's going to make your organization resilient in the, in the new world. So, if this stuff interested you, if you want to read up on it, if you don't take my word for it, you want to do a bit of your own further research, I recommend three books that are out there. The first one is The Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab, who's part of the World Economic Forum. And basically his message is, the working world has changed and modern organizations are mostly unprepared. That's a little bit of what I told you today. Uh, the second one is a book that's been around for a while, Anti-Fragile by Massim Taleb. Um, if you can stand his writing and his rants, he's got some good messages. Um, truly resilient systems are those which grow stronger from disorder. And the last one, if you're into resilience, you want to see where resilience is going and the true purpose of resilience, uh, uh, Zolia and Healy's book on resilience, where their message is resilience is secured by achieving a state of intelligent responses. And they introduce this concept of bouncing back versus bouncing forward. So, those are the books to read over Christmas break. Good luck with that. Um, but all of those, if you put them together, will give you the same messages of watch gates today. So it's not just me. There are a lot of people who are advocating it. And this is the way that risk management is ultimately going to go. All right, you made it. Well done.